So for a rare disease, uh, we still use basic standard medical oncology principles for treatment. So patients who present with adenoid cystic cancer uh, carcinomas or ACCs in the salivary gland, um, and it doesn't have to spread anywhere else below the shoulders. Our common approaches is thinking first about surgery. Can we use a surgical approach to get around all of the tumor and remove it from the patient's body? And then we think about based upon what that tumor looks like, uh, whether or not radiation treatment is indicated. And so the intention of those types of treatments is to eliminate the cancer so that it never comes back again, a, what we call a curative intent approach. The idea is to cure patients with that approach. Now, sometimes patients, however, will present with a disease and it already has spread below the shoulders. And when I say that, what I mean is to distant sites like the lung, uh, to the liver, to the bone, um, or, or other places. In those type of situations, the disease is not necessarily curable, but treatable, okay? And what I mean by that is whatever modalities that we use to treat cancer, whether it be surgery, radiation, or drug therapy, they can be effective for combating the disease, but not so much so for eliminating completely so it never comes back again. And so those types of patients can present that way. You can, you know, never had had the diagnosis and then immediately present with a tumor in the salivary gland, but also in the, in the lungs or in the, in the bones. Or these patients that I discussed previously that only had in the salivary gland, had it removed, got radiation, and then maybe years later, the tumor shows up in other places. So what's unique about adenoid cystic carcinomas or, or, or ACC is that there is a subset of these, even when they're spread to distant places and incurable, uh, that can be very slow growing or indolent. There's a subset of those patients where maybe you have lung metastases and you have no symptoms. If you didn't know that they were there, you would never even imagine that they were there, that um, have no impairment in the way they function. And on scans as we follow them can grow either not at all or incredibly slowly. So in fact, even in patients with metastatic ACC that's incurable, for some of these patients, the most appropriate approach is just to watch because you can get away for months or even years before the tumors grow substantially enough where they need treatment. Having said that, there is a subset of ACC that we're increasingly learning about that are more aggressive. Um, so for the patients where they had the slow growing indolent ones and then they start to grow, or we already know they're the more aggressive subtype, then we would think about treatment, okay? And usually in that circumstance, because it's already spread to distant places, the treatments that we often think about are drug therapies. The reason we think about that is because drug therapies, whether administered through the IV or orally, can go throughout your entire body to treat multiple sites of cancer. We still do think about the role of surgery and radiation, even when it's spread to multiple sites, but usually in those circumstances, I think about it in, the, in situations where I feel like one particular tumor is more dangerous than the others or causing a particular symptom, and we're trying to relieve that symptom or we're trying to, to diminish the risk of that particular tumor. Otherwise, it's thinking about drug therapies. Okay. Now, here's where the difficulty and the challenge is and why research is so important. Um, when you think about all the other kind of common cancers that we see, whether it be lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, the drugs that we use for patients with incurable cancers or dysmetastatic disease, we know they have ac activity or effectiveness based upon clinical trials. Um, and then they can get FDA approved and we, have, we know that there's a level of activity that is seen with those drugs. The challenge with rare diseases is oftentimes we don't have enough clinical research to really know which drugs work and which drugs don't work. Um, I have to say over the last two decades, we've made significant strides in the development of drugs for rare cancers and particularly for ACCs, because there's now an increasing recognition of the value of developing drugs for these rare cancers. The, uh, also the utility and the feasibility of doing clinical trials. And so now, as opposed to 15 years ago when we first started some of our ACC research programs, there are so many more efforts to develop drugs in, 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 in the disease. There are more clinical trials, et, et cetera. So while we've made incremental progress in doing more clinical research and trying to identify the drugs that we, we want to use in, in the disease, still as of today, 
there are no FDA approved treatments uh, for the cancer. So what do we do? And what, what are the treatments that we often think about? Well, based upon some small clinical trials and some retrospective data, some of the things I still think about is chemotherapy. Um, there is a utility and a role for chemotherapy. And then we've also done clinical trials uh, evaluating different agents um, uh, that, uh, which we call TKI. So these are oral medications uh, that can inhibit a variety of different pathways, including the way that blood vessels grow, that have been approved for other cancers. And we've done phase two trials suggesting there may be some activity in adenoid cystic carcinomas. Now you have to know that outside of a clinical trial, the use of all these agents are what we call off-label. There is no FDA approved indication for them, um, but in certain specific circumstances, their use, um, because we have some clinical trial data, can be a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable option.